Good evening to all our listeners um, all over the world. Welcome to this webinar. It's the first in the series of the Sustainable Recovery Webinars from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And I'm Oshani Pereira. I lead the work on infrastructure. And to get right stuck into it, welcome Gail Whiteman. You are the founder of the Arctic Base Camp and you are perhaps the most relevant and poignant voice in getting politicians and business leaders to understand the opportunities around climate change. It's well and good to talk about the risks and the doom and gloom scenario, but one never talks about the opportunities. So thank you, Gail, for opening the door for us. My, my now, pleasure. thank you, Gail. Yes. And now we in our part of the world, Gail is in Rotterdam and I am in, near Geneva in France. We are perhaps seeing the end of the emergency phase of COVID-19. We are moving into the phase of employment subsidies and we're looking at the recovery. Other countries like Brazil are deep still in the pandemic. So what hope can we offer the world that there can be a greener recovery, Gail? Well, thanks, Oshani. I, I just wanted to say thanks to you and IISD for highlighting this really important topic. Of course, the last, you know, four months, and, and if you were in Hong Kong and in China, uh, longer than that, have been a massive wake-up call for all of us, those of us from the scientific communities, but you know, as citizens, as politicians, and of course, as business leaders, we've seen that the impossible in terms of risk can really happen. And that can be extremely damaging, not just to our health, but also to our economies. And we've also seen the impossible happen, which is where we've seen governments around the world put human health and well-being above the economy, which is really, in my uh, memory, uh, so certainly and the only time I have ever seen that happen. And, and it's happened because the threat seemed real. And the threat seemed real because we could see it. And of course, because the media covered it on a daily basis. And, 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 and I think people started to just finally take it seriously. It wasn't that we didn't know that this could happen. Uh, the question was that it did happen. And you know, life before COVID-19, uh, to now is completely different in terms of our, our mindsets. So I think that the very fact that, that we have had a paradigm shift in the way we think about our invincibility as a human species is actually can be good news for the climate agenda. And what is the good news? Where well, do you see the signs? Of yeah, so the time, I mean, so, recovery. Yeah. so I see them and see them in a couple, a couple of different ways. The, the first is that if we take a look at, say, for example, what the EU is doing on, in, in, in the, the Green New Deal in terms of their COVID-19 recovery packages, that is good news. They have not forgotten about uh, the need to be low carbon consistent as we rebuild the economy, which clearly we need to do that. So we can see that, that even though you've got many different voices within the, the, the EU and within the nation states supporting the EU, we can see that there is a, 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 you know, unanimity on this, that we have to have a, a green new deal for COVID-19. So I think there are some examples. I also see the media now is, you know, it has been focused um, not on climate change, but on obviously the pandemic. And yet in the last two weeks, I've had calls from a number of major um, media outlets asking more for interviews about climate change. What's the next big threat? So there is this idea that both the media and some of the governments around the world are actually going to take a long-term view. This is fantastic. Uh, tell us more about, other than the EU, we all are grateful for the EU leadership. Any other government that you see as being a leader in this space at this point? Well, I mean, I think there's some, I think there are some indications on this. I actually think that part of the, um, delay or the postponement of COP26, the, the UN climate discussions from this November to the following November has been a very good, a very good thing. Normally we would be horrified that these national governments have delayed, but this time it actually gives us a chance as a national government to take it seriously. So the very fact they delayed this 
means that there is sort of a general consensus that we need to actually get a grip on it. Simultaneously, though, it does mean that what we're doing in the next six months with COVID recovery response will be absolutely critical. The UK is talking a lot right now. Will they walk it? I don't. I absolutely don't know it. But all eyes will be on China, US, and Brazil with India as well. How are they going to respond? And I think the US election will be, will be uh, definitely an important part of that puzzle. Um, but you're also a professor in residence at the World Business Council for Sustainable yeah. Development. What about companies? What do you see there? Who are the fast movers? Yeah, so, you know, I think the remarkable thing from the corporate landscape is that, first of all, there was a, a lot of companies, um, both big multinationals and national companies and probably small local companies as well, that immediately jumped into the how can we help with the pandemic. So you saw big uh, multinationals say, how are we gonna shift our production lines, go into um, uh, vaccine or, or protective equipment production. We saw it in the retail sector, but we saw, certainly saw it in manufacturing as well. And this idea, like, let's take what we know and let's help. We've also seen, and I've done in the last two months, a series of very high level uh, interviews with senior executives around the world and I've heard really inspiring stories, both about how big boards um, demanded to be briefed on COVID and are now asking the question, what other systemic risks do we really need to make collective action on? And I'm hearing that not just from uh, Western Europe, I'm hearing it from Asia, and I'm hearing it also from the US. So I'm seeing that there is this idea that, that, that hey, companies are actually willing to stand up and say, um, we've got we've got to, we've got to do something here, and we're going to support the the low carbon uh, recovery right now. And um, taking a question from the audience before we leave uh, the low carbon recovery and move on to the science behind the recovery. Yeah. The question goes as as countries start to rebuild the economy with consideration for reducing carbon emissions, are there any burgeoning discussions anywhere around about changing the fundamental economic model towards one based on Kate Ransworth donut economic model? Yeah, so I mean, certainly there's been a lot of talk about um, donut economic models. Um, I'm I'm a scientist, so I think that that um, you know calling the economy a donut uh, is is a little um, interesting as a metaphor. It, the question is, what's the substance behind it? Now, certainly Kate works um, looking at the planetary boundaries, Earth system science uh, constraints, and raised a very good question probably about ten years ago, which was where was human human well being within the planetary boundaries framework? And at the time, what she did was um, not go to science. She actually went to uh, government commitments on Rio plus 20 and looked at what were the social levers that governments were looking for in those discussions of which she created uh, donut economics. I think from a scientific perspective, what we would really say is what we need to do is look at adaptive capacity within that. So how do earth system science linked, link into what we do, both economically, but also socially? So I think it's, it's more complicated. I do know that the uh, city of Amsterdam is looking closely at uh, donut economics. So your, your, your viewer may want to see what uh, Amsterdam is doing uh, from that perspective. For me, I tend to take a more of a, 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 a scientific basis for economics, and that is slightly different than what Kate does. And elaborate a bit more on this scientific basis, Gail, because it's a nice segue into what I wanted to discuss next. Yeah, well, I think, I think that social sciences um, has uh, for a long time really looked at what are the key uh, things that, that, that social systems need to thrive and uh, need to protect the natural systems on which we all depend. So I actually think a better model for economics actually are the sustainable development goals. Social science and natural science were brought in quite directly within that. And I think if we look at those SDGs, those are a great set of targets and that's what economics should be built on. So I don't think we necessarily have to do donuts or muffins or whatever. I think what we need to do is do the SDGs. Let's do the SDGs indeed. You remind me of 
what Professor Dasgupta said, who is leading the British review on biodiversity and biodiversity risk. It's the review from Her Majesty's Treasury. And he said, never did I realize till now that nature has no place in economics. So uh, w w we need a change in mindset. We do, and I think there are some, I mean, I think if you take a look at Teeb, so, you know, there's the whole bringing in valuing nature, valuing biodiversity, how you bring it into economics, the work that, that, that the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and many others does around natural capital and trying to figure out the natural and social capital that business needs. I think those things are much more rigorously underpinned. And, and the new organization, which is a, a, you know, related to many, including the World Economic Forum and WBCSD called Business for Nature, is a great example of how you can mobilize uh, that new, those new ways of thinking for, about, uh, about the economy. Uh, and business for nature is about companies valuing biodiversity in nature? Well, I think what it is is, ab is about figuring out what is the value of ecosystem services and how do you bring that into your investment uh, and, and operational decisions? How do you bring that in? And that often means that you have to bring it in beyond just the individual project or individual firm. You need to look at it more from a value chain perspective, but also from say a watershed perspective. So it's an interesting way of how do you bring that in? The science is developing. We certainly need a lot more in this space. And I think IISD has been working uh, also uh, on this. So perhaps you could, you could expand a bit on that. But I, I do think it's about how do we actually see how this system, and let's look at even a local watershed, how is that valuing many different parties, not just an individual business or community or, or a nation state? It's of course got, it, it's trans boundaries. So, so how do we value that? And then how do we, how do we come up with much more, I think, um, robust decisions? Uh, Gail, now in this valuing endeavor. Yes. Some of the values in terms of an investor or a company would remain external to their company or a particular project. Let's take a watershed. If you are an agro or a food system, uh, you're in the value chain, you're a farmer, yeah. and there is a drought issue, but your irrigation supply is secure, but when we look globally at the watershed, there is a diminishing water supply and we are facing a future drought issue. At this point in time, because my water supply is somewhat safe, that drought remains an externality. It is not affecting my cash flow. And many business yeah. leaders are saying, oh, it doesn't affect my cash flow as yet. It's an externality. Let government deal with it. What's your right. answer? So my answer is, is that's where government has to step into the valuing of nature, because if they simply take all the financial and social risk from these externalities, that's an expensive price tag. So that's that, and as we it, we, we definitely see that kind of stuff when we look at the pandemic. You know, is it just the government's uh, cost here? Well, no, of course, business is also picking up the tab. So this is where I think we can't simply let the market solve it. The market's not going to solve it until we change. Uh, things like how we file um, a Securities Exchange Commission reports. How do we look at material risk? How do we file those? How does the board become, uh, understand their fiduciary responsibility for those externalities? And I think there's lots of things that have started on that, but we need a definite strong role for not just governments individually, but collectively. And I mean, I think there's, there's, there's no question we need to start to put prices on things, uh, price, price for carbon would be a good, a good start. Uh, hearing you, Gail. Hearing you, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. We've, we've done a lot of work in actually valuing the sequestration from wetlands, for example. So how much is a ton of phosphates being sequestered by a wetland? What does it cost? How much is a ton of nitrogen being sequestered? How much does that cost? And in many ways, because we're so driven by the green back, we're so driven by the financial return. Uh, we're busy looking at how to put values in that. But coming back to 
the case in point. If if we go to the Arctic and we look at the heat wave ongoing in the Arctic, we also look at the oil spill that happened north of Siberia in June where the permafrost collapsed and, and caused a very large oil spill. Now, that is an inherent risk. Yeah. Within the course of the pandemic, do you see governments beginning to use that risk to push forward their climate agenda? Well, I certainly see a lot more companies and governments interested in the idea of systemic risk and costs from climate change. Now, with the Arctic, my team, you, you, you introduced me by saying I, I founded Arctic Base Camp. And to give a bit of a, a context on that, that is a, um, a not-for-profit set up by scientists to bring uh, the dangers of Arctic change into discussions on global risk around the world. So we take scientists to the World Economic Forum at Davos, and we try to explain that what's happening in the Arctic doesn't stay there, it affects the rest of the world in a lot of different ways. Things, the Arctic of course affects the global climate system and is it, as it melts, and as you're seeing, you've identified a number of, 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 of very recent examples of, of things that are showing it's out of whack, with that poses a lot of risks, not just for Arctic countries. In fact, there may be short-term economic benefits for some of those countries, but actually it causes real risk because it ramps up climate change elsewhere. It also, of course, will affect the way we grow food. And we can start to put price tags on those things. So if we lose the Arctic summer sea ice or permafrost thaws, what are the, what's the economic value or, or cost to the rest of the world from that? And I've got a team that, that, that do economic modeling and they publish a number of interesting papers looking at exactly, exactly on that. And it's very expensive, trillions of US dollars. It is not a cheap thing to lose the albedo, which is essentially what part of the Earth's um, um, defense system uh, or insurance policy on runaway climate change. And when you lose that, the costs go up very, very quickly. It's kind of like if you didn't shut down fast with COVID, the cost of dealing with that pandemic was astronomically larger, say in the UK, than it might've been in say Singapore per capita. I'm talking obviously there's difference, differences in populations or, or South Korea. So I think, there is this idea, and again, I was, you know, I was very impressed with, with some of the European countries responding individually. Not all of them did, and this is important to see some differences within the EU. For example, with the bailout of, of a number of the big uh, airplane or um, um, airline com companies, um, Air France, for example, was uh, offered bailouts from the French government, but tied to that were low carbon um, commitments that they had to stop flying on routes internally in France, which is a large country, if it could be used by train. So they said, if you want the money, you're gonna to have to pony up and do better. And they did. Let's look at Lufthansa. They did not have those strings attached by the German government. Why? Well, that's a missed opportunity, I would say. So I think we've got to really take a look at how individual countries are starting to say, we have to work together and you're just simply gonna to have to do it. And it's just like being locked down. If we voluntarily do this, we don't really. We have to be told you have to do it. And then people largely follow. So I think there's a lot of lessons here. And there's a lot of boards now that are asking to have a scientist come and explain systemic risk from different things like climate change to the board because they're worried. It's expensive. And do you think that it's these catastrophic risks that are making people want to understand the science yeah I mean, because i do i mean i think that i think if you if you just look at the cultural shift you know around christmas time at least in in um um english speaking the english speaking world um people were still saying oh you know my cousin said this on facebook about whatever right and all of a sudden everybody's seeing scientists medical scientists in this case alongside their government talking about risk and people want the expertise. So all of a sudden, as scientists, we are seen as actually having some knowledge because people were scared. Right. And seeing that we need to be led by science was actually not a dumb thing, was maybe a very useful thing. There's debates about if you really are led by science or not, that's true, but we are definitely seeing that. I also think there's a big cultural shift on those travelers, especially for business that have been 
um, you know, going around the world doing things. Well, people don't want to travel and they've realized that they can actually do a heck of a lot like this on a Zoom call without, I don't have to come to Geneva, you, you don't have to come up here, we can actually do this. And, and maybe our, our, our lighting is not as great as, as, as it could be uh, next time around because we'll get better as, as, we, as we do this. But I think it's this idea that things are shifted or, or I'm hearing all kinds of big, the big four consulting agencies, uh, uh, com companies are saying, we don't need, or investment firms are saying, we don't need the big offices in London anymore. We don't need the real estate. Our teams have been working at home for four months. Why are we paying premium prices on office space? Which means, and they're traveling, so you've got the carbon of, even if they're taking public transportation, you're, you, most of them are driving still, not maybe in London, but many parts of the world. And people are saying, we don't need to do this. We can actually have better quality of life, work at home many days a week, and go in sometimes to, of course, get that human interaction, which we all crave a little bit. So I'm seeing real changes. I, I'm, I've heard really CEOs say to me, I'm not flying. I'm not flying for a meeting. I am going to Zoom. I have heard of a very big investment company that did um, a major deal uh, on, a, on actually on low carbon um, uh, infrastructure and they had the uh, they had pitches all done by zoom didn't meet people and 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 completed multi multi-million dollar deal on that so that's a big change we've learned that actually technology can be our friend and we don't always need to be in a mad panic to get to the airport or get into the car or the train and for the first time in our living history, we have scientists as superstars. So we have a Professor Fortry in the in the US. We have Didier Raoul here in France. So um, I agree, it is quite a game changer. It is quite a game changer. Um, one of the uh, quest uh, questions being posed by our audience is now: How do we change the messaging or improve the messaging about the climate crisis and wider systemic risks to the non-converts? Joe blogs on the street might still know not know what climate is. Yeah, so I think we don't need to talk about climate so much as threats to food. So threats to your food. And when we, we thought we were threatened um, by food shortages, gosh, everybody went and made sure they got food and they reused it and they started to bake bread and you know, do all these things. So we have to focus on the end benefits slash risks. It's not that climate is important to us, it's that it's too hot or our food supply is not stable or our water is not stable or we're gonna get hit by extreme weather. So I'm less concerned that 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 people um, that may deny, may think the word climate change is bipartisan is 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 um, you know made up by a, one political party. I'm more interested in, in saying is if you are worried by, about extreme weather events, fires, floods, droughts, um, etc., then you need to be looking at this. These are ways to to stop those risks. If you want to make sure your food system is protected you got to look after it. So I think, I think we need to stop focusing on, you know, albedo effect mm -hmm. and focusing on what's, what are these people, what are they really risk, worried about? They're worried about getting food on the table, you know, getting their lifestyle not disrupted, which extreme weather always does. And, and they're worried about their kids' future. So we need to focus on those things that make sense to people. Now, I'm not a communications expert, but maybe we need a big ad agency to help us. But that's what I would think. A good point, Gail. Um, if I might be slightly controversial, I would say if you're worried about refugees and Absolutely. how to deal with refugees in Western Europe and other OECD countries, you might also worry about the climate crisis more. Yeah, right. because we, kn we know how this will have migration. If, and it's already having migration. Absolutely. It's already Absolutely. having migration. And then um, uh, the question that comes up from our audience is also, what are the market-based instruments that you see coming up? Well, that... well, sure, well surely, I mean, there's a ton of market-based instruments happening right now in terms of new forms of investment and short-term loans and subsidies. So there's these market-based investments that are being offered, for example, to Air France, and then in exchange, they're going to do, uh, get the economy back, 
uh, on, the, on, on the road and also do something else. So I think there's some simple things, but market-based uh, incentives can also be a uh, carbon tax. I mean, there, this is whether you are a price on carbon, let's put it that way, whether you prefer a, a, a tax or some other um, price me pricing mechanism, that is a clear thing that we, we need to do. And once you put that in, things are not um, financially viable. And when, and when you know, decisions are being made, for example, in Canada, when the Canadian government decided to purchase a uh, um, buyout, um, a no longer uh, financially viable pipeline, uh, because of all the environmental protests around it, that was the wrong decision that the Trudeau government made because it was not based on the science, it was based on a very short-term understanding of economics. And yet if, the, if, the, if that pipeline is not viable, because of all the, the, the pressure around minimizing externalities, it's not a good financial decision, whether you're a company or a government. So I think we need to embed those things in, in, in a much more thorough way in our, our, our decision making. And the other market uh, instrument, at, at least that has been a soft but very impactful one, is the, the work that Mark Carney did and Mike Bloomberg on the Task Force on Climate Related Material Disclosure where companies who signed on, and many hundreds of them have done so, looked at their real material risks um, from climate change. And my team did consulting for a very large um, uh, agricultural company, globally known, and said, these are your risks for, your four, for four key commodity crops that your business is based upon. And they were shocked. Now, they had a lot of metrics on what they were doing on climate change. But they suddenly started to realize that it's not just what they do, it's what the rest of the world does that will affect them. If they can't get coffee in this country anymore, that means they have a choice. They can simply leave that country. But then what is their social impact? Are they able to and still walk their image as a reputable com com company? So I think there's some very interesting um, movements here that, that we've seen with the, the task force on climate related um, material. Uh, disclosure. So well done to Mr. Carney on that one. I, I do agree. This is going to be a game changer in terms of disclosure as well as with understanding risks. These instruments though, are they beginning to get at the social and income inequality though? Okay. Yeah, no, I think that I think that is an area that that certainly large corporates had been talking about and not really um, having a collective response yet to. But we've seen not just the pandemic over the last four months, we've seen the social unrest that has come up from um, inequalities, also fueled by protests like Black Lives Matter, that are getting companies literally talking about saying, we've got to reinvent the system. Like it doesn't work on so many levels. And it's a real zeitgeist change that I've never seen before. And, and, and people are authentically talking about this. They don't have the answers, but they are talking about it in a way that I hadn't seen them talk about it in four months, four months earlier. So quite, quite a difference. So is it reasonable to expect, let's take my favorite economic instrument, which is the border carbon adjustment yep. uh, of the European Union, because it'll change how value chains are, are engineered and value <coughs> chains are connected. So if you take the border carbon adjustment, do you see that as the implementation of the climate law happens, that there could be economic instruments that are tweaked to also address parts of uh, income inequality. Example, example. Yeah, I mean, I mean you're, you're much more of an expert on, on, on the, the tax instruments. So I, I'm gonna defer to your authority on that for sure, Oshani, but I would say absolutely. And, and all I can recommend is that when any of the governments, policymakers and think tanks are coming up with these put in different kinds of scientists in the room with you as, as a sort of a, a litmus test for uh, um, are you getting it right? Uh, an example of that would be is that in the UK when we see these press conferences, which used to happen on a daily basis and now it's sort of sporadically happened, but they would bring in their medical doctor to, you know, you know uh, Chris Witte or Sir Patrick Valance alongside. Well, when Rishi Sunak, um, 
talks this week about what his economic recovery plan is, I would like to see, for COVID, I would like to see a climate scientist from the UK standing there alongside him to reassure me and us that actually their COVID-19 uh, economic uh, recovery plan is compliant with a low carbon future. Because if it isn't, we are just simply wasting huge amounts of money to deal with one problem when we could deal with two massive risks at the same time. So yes, I, I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned and there's very specific instruments like these tax adjustments that could be worked very effectively to do climate and to do social inequities alongside it. Let's deal with these things now. And going back to Rishi Sunak sitting alongside or standing alongside the climate scientist. So our listeners are asking about the systemic synchronization between social inequity and climate and environmental degradation. So your scientist brings that very vividly into the picture. What do we need to actually make Rishi do that? What needs to happen? Because it's unlikely to happen. Yeah. So yeah. So is it is it um you know, is, is, this, is this where we come back into the school strikes and, 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 and Greta Thunberg and we bring that together with science and with Black Lives Matter and start to pressure the UK government as a host of the next year's COP26 to do this more thoroughly? I honestly, I'm not sure. Do we get the, the companies, the big multinationals that also agree with this to start pressuring? I'm not sure. I mean, I wish I had the answer to that question because then I would pressure Mr. Sunak most, most definitely. Uh, maybe the answer is, Gail, that we need to work together to show uh, Dr. Sunak, I do believe he has a PhD, what would it cost the UK if he didn't? Good point. Yes. And money talks. We know that. And money talks. And money talks even louder during a recovery because we see that it's going to be a very pop long and painful recession. Yes, it is. And it, it's not good for any of us to have a long and painful recession on COVID recovery and then walk into catastrophic climate change impacts that threaten food security, water security, um, amplify uh, um, and migration massively, um, and, and also have extreme weather events all around the world. I mean, that's just, that's just crazy. Uh, and the last question from uh, our audience before we close. Ooh, two questions. Uh, is it possible to create an economic model that puts human well-being and environment ahead of, uh, of profitability? And the second question is, uh, but there is a rising movement to move the zero net date to much earlier than 2050. Yeah. Your opinion? So why don't I take the zero net date first and then close on the economic question. I would say that it, 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 certainly the science supports uh, an earlier date rather than a later date. The, the date for, to get a net zero to net zero of 2050 is based on a range of assumptions um, and models. So the earlier we can get there, the better. That means we actually have a bit of a safety uh, a, a safety buffer in, in place. So absolutely, let's let's move it forward. I think we can't move it forward um, to 2025, but as fast as we can move that forward would be right. Now, everybody said we couldn't even have emissions by 2030, but that was before COVID. We did a lot of things after COVID that everybody said we couldn't do. You can never do this. Las Vegas, the casinos will never close. Even if there's World War III, they won't close. They did close. <laughs> I just talked to my hairdresser who had been there and they closed. <laughs> so they, 
clothes, lots of things that we thought were fact and true will never happen, actually really, really did. We saw lots of things you know, um, uh, happen that we thought were impossible. So, but the, the key thing from a scientific perspective is that we really don't even want to get at a, at a two degree uh, Celsius warmer world. We want to get as close to 1.5 as possible to ensure that we don't have catastrophic tipping points. So all in for let's go faster rather than slower on that. And is it possible to create an economic world um, that, that puts uh, um, the well-being of, of, of life on the planet, let's say broaden it from beyond just our own, ahead of economics? I definitely believe that. How do we convince the, the stock exchanges around the world to do that? I'm not sure I have the answer, but I'm very encouraged that people like Mark Carney, who do know those things, are involved so uh, deeply now in the, the, the UN discussions around climate as one of the advisors, of course, that, that, that let's hope that we can actually get that nut cracked. But of course we can. We had all kinds of human societies before economics was around, so we can have it uh, not always at the top. And um, yeah, if you don't have hope, I'm not sure what you have. So uh, I'm a, as Christiana Figuera says, I'm a stubborn optimist. So I say yes. And perhaps COVID shows us that yes, we put human health before the economy. Yes. So we shut everything down. So there is hope. Um, and we will ride on that hope. Thank you, Gail, for taking time to talk to me. It's really been a pleasure and your hair looks fabulous. <laughs> so <laughs> not sure that's true, Oshani, but thank you. <laughs> so thank you to your hairdresser too for making you look absolutely splendid as you always do, even better. And great new glasses, by the way. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Cesar Henry Carres, um, who is making this webinar possible. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you for all of you for joining. And until next time, Gail, bravo. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Oshani. <laughs>